Good morning. Um, today is Alma chapter 17. And what's happening here is um, Alma's just going about traveling to Manti, I believe it was. And he runs into the sons of Mosiah. He's like, whoa, what's up, guys? Haven't seen you in 14 years. And they're like, hey, let me tell you a story. So now we switch over to the account of the sons of Mosiah. And it talks about their preparation for their mission. And then it goes straight into the story of Ammon. And in, you know, from the time Alma meets them in the wilderness to the point where uh, Ammon chops off the arm so it gets right to it. Um, so it starts with Ammon doing his missionary work and he's like, all right, I'm going to show these people some power. And he just, anyways, so there was some really good stuff in this supplemental. And um, so it talks a lot about missionary work. And because, hello, it's a 14-year mission. That's all the sons of Mosiah are doing is preaching the gospel to the Lamanites. That's their purpose for 14 years. Um, okay, so it talks about missionary work. And it gives a quote by Gordon B. Hinckley, which I loved, so I'm going to read. It says, We must cultivate in our homes a proper attitude towards missionary service. We enjoy the blessings we so greatly treasure because of those who have gone before us out of a sense of appreciation out of simple gratitude we should make an effort to extend these same blessings to others our young people have an obligation to prepare themselves for missionary service one of the great compliments paid the Savior was that he taught as one having authority the missionary who knows scripture and can quote it speaks with the voice of authority it is not essential to memorize 500 citations, nor even 300. 50 well-chosen verses of scripture will, be, will become a remarkable effective tool in the hands of a missionary. May I suggest that in our family night gatherings we make it a project to memorize one scripture citation a week pertinent to this work. At the conclusion of a year, our children will have on their lips a fund of scripture which will remain with them throughout their lives. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, so I really liked, um, it goes on, but I'm not going to read that part because this is the, the part I liked about um, memorizing scripture with our children. And then after a year, They'll already have those 50, 52 quotes, those scriptures memorized that they'll remember throughout the rest of their life um, if they continue to practice those. But I thought that was just such a great idea and um, a great uh, way to bond the family together. I really liked that idea. Um, and then it gives kind of a formula for preparing to teach and preach as a missionary and it says be in the Lord by following our Savior and keeping his commandments and it's taking some of these um, quote it, it's in quotations and it takes it out of Alma 17 2 through 3 so it's saying what they they had done and it's putting it in our words so be in the Lord by following the Savior and keeping His commandments. Wax strong in the knowledge of the truth. Be of a sound understanding. Search the scriptures diligently to know the word of God. Pray and fast. So that's how um, they prepared for their mission. And here's another bit I liked. It says, Missionaries who have prepared to serve and willingly to work hard being exactly, immediately, and courageously obedient will always enjoy the Spirit on their missions and have greater success in working with the people. And I loved how it said, being exactly, immediately, and courageously obedient. And that doesn't just apply to missionaries. We can take that into our own lives and be like, if I am 
exactly, immediately, and courageously obedient, I can, I can have the Spirit with me always, and I can be successful in my day-to-day -day life, in my ministering, in my calling, in my relationships with, you know, the family. So I like that. I put that in my scriptures. Um, and... Um, talks about Ammon and how he was a man of God. Um, and then it talks about Lamoni. I don't think I want to. Okay, but then it talks about being wise. Um, and, you know, here in this, we're talking about. Ammon, he's been captured by the Lamanites. They bring him before the king. And the king's like, what do you want? You want to live here? And he's like, yeah, probably until I die. And Lamoni's like, awesome, cool, okay. How about you marry one of my daughters? And Ammon's like, no, I'll be your servant. And so it says, how does one approach a king with any hope of influence in, hope to influence his thinking and behavior? Being wise, yet harmless, Ammon first becomes a servant to the king and then seeks opportunity for awakening within him an awareness of the power of the Spirit of God. The formula is simple. First a servant, then a teacher. And it says missionary work is a labor of love. This is anchored in the attitude of service towards those we teach. Let us become more effective teachers in family, church, and community by ensuring that our motivation is centered in charity and service and that we depend fully upon the Lord for guidance. And um, uh, this stuck out to me because, um, you know, he's like, he could have married the daughter and become his son-in-law and tried to influence him that way, as many of dis the dissenters do, you know, flatter the king, that sort of thing. But Ammon, he's like, no, let me serve you. Let me be your servant. I can prove my worth to you, and then and then I can have influence, not have influence over you, but then I can teach you. You know, you'll trust me. If I prove my worth to you, then you'll trust me. So I really like that. And then it gives a quote by Ezra Taft Benson. It says, while I was, it was while I was on my first mission that I discovered the constant need for my dependence on the Lord. I learned through experience that I could not convince another soul to come unto Christ. I learned that one cannot convert another by just quoting scripture. Conversion comes when another is touched by the Spirit of the Lord and receives a witness dependent, independent of the missionary uh, that what he or she is being taught is true. I learned that a missionary is only a vessel through whom the Lord can transmit his Spirit. To acquire that Spirit, a missionary must humble himself in prayer and ask our Heavenly Father to use him to touch the hearts of investigators. The first lesson of missionary work is to be dependent on the Lord for our success. And that's, I think that's the first lesson in life, is to be dependent on the Lord, not just in missionary work. Um, okay. So, now we've come to the part where... Um, the Lamanites have scattered the flock and the other servants are kind of freaking out. You know, they're like, oh no, the king's going to kill us like he killed our brethren because apparently this happens a lot. All the Lamanites go to the river, the waters of Sebus, and the king's flocks get scattered a lot because he's killed servants before for this happening. So the mm -hmm. servants currently are... Um, are upset. They're crying. It says they were, um, they wept because of the fear of being slain. And Ammon's like, ooh, I get to show forth my power. I get to, I get to convince them of the Lord. I get to, I get to use that spirit that's in me to prove something to them. So he takes this opportunity to, to you, this opportunity of, uh, what do I do now? Changes it into yay! I get to be, I get to have a missionary experience. So, um, 
Ammon rejoices in the oppor opportunity to gain credibility with his colleagues through the demonstration of the power of God. As we live righteously, the power of God is made manifest in us. If we are willing, the Lord will provide the opportunity and give us the strength as well as the words to say to bless people's lives. Elder Neil A. Maxwell taught this principle. God does not begin by asking us about our ability, but only about our availability. And if we then prove our dependability, he will increase our capability. And that one went in the scriptures. Um, it's, it's, what is it? It's very true. It's very dur, but it's also like, duh, you know, he doesn't ask about our capabilities, you know, before he gives us a calling, he doesn't say, well, Haley, what are your strengths and what are your talents? He says, Haley, what time do you have available? I have something for you. And then if I prove my de dependability, if I listen to the promptings, if I do what I'm asked in that calling, then he increases my capability to better fulfill that calling. I loved it. I went in the scriptures. Loved it. Okay. Then it gives two evidences. You know I love my evidences. Okay, so it's talking about uh, Lamanite games at the waters of Cebus. And um, so, though it seems strange to modern readers, the practice of plunder among the Lamanites at the waters of Cebus was pr uh, among the Lamanites at the waters of Cebus was probably much like a game, a game that followed specific rules. Ammon's slaying of several men and smiting off the arms of the others may appear harsh, but archaeological evidence shows that in many such ceremonial games the loser was killed. As examples of such deadly games, Hugh Nibley lists Aztec duels, chariot races of the princes, the ancient game of Nimai, and then there's a few ones that I can't pronounce, the Old Norse Brain Ball, the Hanging Games of the Celts, and so on. The most dramatic example of this phenomenon may be the ball games played in ancient Mesoamerica where members of the losing team were often beheaded. So, um, you're like, wow, he, he really went to extremes there, but if this is, you know, I, I don't know, it's just saying that in those ancient days there were games where if you lost, you died. So it's not that harsh if that's in fact what it was. And then it gives another evidence of this, of the smiting off the arms. It says, Ammon's severing of the arms of King Lamoni's enemies leaves some readers wondering why such an honorable servant of God would perform such a gruesome feat. But Hugh Nibley points out that on ancient Egyptian monuments, depictions of battle scenes show piles of severed hands and arms delivered to the king as trophies. Recent research has revealed that in Mesoamerica, an arm was considered a war trophy and was as valuable as fine jewelry taken from a dead opponent. In the last one, in at least one first-hand account, Aztec warriors held up the severed arms of their s sacrificed battle opponents to warn the Spanish and their allies against further aggression. According to scholars John Welch and John Lundquist, Many ancient reliefs portray Assyrian troops cutting off the heads, hands, and feet of their conquered foes. Uh, not feet, feet. Um, it is highly improbable that Joseph Smith would have had access to this information. Therefore, it is one more evidence of the Book of Mormon's authenticity. So I found that very fascinating that you're like, Cutting, that's really weird that they're cutting off the arms. You know, it's like the only time it mentions it, but then there's also, um, anyways, there are some gruesome things that happen in war times and in defending oneself. And this is one of those things where you're like, why did he cut off the arms? And I always figured it was just like, he didn't want to kill the people. He was just trying to defend the flocks, you know, like, okay. You've been warned. 
All right, now you've been warned. Okay, now you've been warned. <laughs> but anyways, and that also explains why the servants carry the arms back to the king, is that they're trophies. All right, that's all I had. Um, that's all for chapter 17. And uh, I love you all. And I will talk to you later.